It's my pleasure this evening to uh, introduce uh, Joe Weber, Professor Emeritus at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, who will discuss the campus ferment that followed the October 7th, 2023 attacks in Israel. Uh, Professor Weber is a longtime journalist who has studied such terrorist uh, organizations as ISIS. Uh, the uh, title of today's, this evening's program is Campuses in Turmoil, Protests about Israel and the Hamas War. Uh, Joe is uh, with us this evening from the Rocky Mountain state of Colorado, and we're glad to have him with us, and we look forward to a terrific presentation. Norman, thanks very much. And I, I thank Norman, an old friend, for inviting me to join you all today. Um, the topic is part of perhaps the most troublesome development in Israel in most of our lifetimes. And that, of course, is the Israel-Hamas war, a, a battle for nothing less than the continued existence of the state of Israel. Um, I was asked to talk about the reactions on various campuses in the U.S. Now, these have ranged from relatively peaceful demonstrations to passionate ones, and even to a small but very troublesome amount of violence. Uh, most of you, I suspect, have followed the news on this. So events on campuses, uh, including uh, Harvard, and MIT, Columbia, Cornell, the University of California, Berkeley, and particularly Penn, those things may be somewhat familiar to you. Now, the common denominator is public actions and statements by pro-Palestinian students, and in some cases, faculty. Though there also have been demonstrations in favor of Israel. And there have been some very somber displays like this one at Northwestern. We've also seen some actions by Jewish young people protesting Israel's actions. Now, that last one there at the University of Pennsylvania is quite interesting because if you look closely, the student's backpack says, Queer Jews for Black Liberation. Now, let me make two points. First, a noted Muslim cleric in the West Bank has called for gays to be thrown off roofs and then stoned because they're gay. And indeed, one young gay man in Hebron was beheaded in 2022. And this slogan makes a point about students nowadays seeing the world in very, very stark terms. Oppressor and oppressed. With Palestinians, brown people, and others oppressed by whites, including Jews. And I'll get to that a bit more in a moment. To return to my main theme, though, part of the campus dynamic that we've heard about deals with wealthy donors pulling their contributions back because they're enraged by these demonstrations. Rich donors, particularly Jewish donors, at places such as Harvard and Penn, have been pulling their money out because they can't abide what they're seeing. And I believe that's having an effect. Since Penn appointed a prominent Jewish woman, Julie Platt, temporarily as interim chair in a leadership shakeup there. Mrs. Platt also chairs the Jewish Federations of North America. Some of you may know her. She recently has gone back to her post as vice chair with another trustee taking over the chair's position at Penn. Now at Harvard, where Claudine Gay recently resigned as president, a Jewish man, Provost Dr. Alan Garber, was named as interim president. He defended free speech in a talk at a Hillel dinner, but Dr. Garber has also condemned the phrase used in a lot of the pro-Palestinian demonstrations from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'll tell you a bit more about that language in a little bit, too. Now, at Cornell, there's a new effort to drive out the president and provost there. Their critics are troubled by anti-Semitism on the campus, as well as by diversity efforts that they say stifle free speech. Um, after October 7th, a mentally disturbed student at Cornell made some very ugly threatening posts against Jewish, against Jewish students on social media, and he's now facing a federal charge in connection with that. But let me start, those are the headlines, but let me start with a little backgrounding that is essential 
to understand what underlies some of these actions. Many young people, including some young Jewish people, have been siding with the Palestinians, and we need to examine why. A poll released in mid-November by Quinnipiac College found that more than half of American voters aged 18 to 34, 52% were more sympathetic to Palestinians compared with just 29% whose sympathies lay with Israel. This was an astonishing reversal from October, shortly after the October 7th atrocities. Back then, 41% of voters sided with the Israelis and just 26% sided with the Palestinians. Of course, this reversal followed Israel's invasion of Gaza, which has been a very bloody affair for Palestinians, with lots of accompanying news coverage, of course. Also, half of these young people think the U.S. is too supportive of Israel. Again, a surprising number, but half of them think the U.S. is too supportive of Israel. We see more support for Israel among young Jewish people, but even among them, many are troubled by the latest actions in Gaza. The Jewish Electoral Institute, in a survey released on December 9th, 200 American Jews under 40, found they were less supportive for sending aircraft carriers to the region. They were less supportive of President Joe Biden's visit to Israel on October 18th, and more supportive of humanitarian pauses and a ceasefire than older Jewish people, people like many of us on this call, I would imagine. Over 70% agreed that Hamas committed atrocities and war crimes, but over 40% also said that Israel was guilty of the same. Again, an amazing bit of perception, a troubling bit of perception. And more than a quarter of the sample believed that Israel was engaged in genocide against the Palestinians which I find astonishing. Some 35% considered themselves to be both pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel. We're also seeing a split by age on worries about anti-Semitism in general in the US and on campuses in particular. In general, older Jewish people are more concerned about it than younger ones are. More young people seem to be worried about racism on campus than about anti-Semitism. Note that 37% figure there. But we are also seeing widespread ignorance in the general population about the Holocaust. This is also very disturbing. One fifth of US citizens between the ages of 18 and 29 believe that the Holocaust is a myth. So what we have seen generally is a softening of support for Israel in the current war among young people of all sorts. Very disturbing. Furthermore, there's a mentality on many campuses that works in tandem with that phenomenon. One student who was quoted in the Wall Street Journal said that her generation tends to divide the world into two simple categories, oppressor and oppressed. There's no nuance. The world is black and white with people such as the Palestinians in the oppressed camp. If that view is valid, it's a simplistic view that nonetheless is very common. It's also a view that allows Palestinian sympathizers to play down the horrors of October 7th and to play up the ugliness in Gaza now. To put a finer point on it, a Harvard-Harris poll in December reported that 44% of Americans ages 25 to 34 and a whopping 67% of those between 18 and 24, agreed with the statement that Jews as a class are oppressors. Oppressors. It's hard to imagine this. By contrast, over only 9% of Americans over 65 felt that way. The gulf is enormous between us older folks and the younger ones. I don't want to throw too many numbers at you, but we have also seen a sharp uptick in anti-Semitic incidences. The Anti-Defamation League recently reported that since October 7th, US anti-Semitic incidents reached the highest number of any during any three-month three period since ADL began tracking in 1979. 
the ADL recorded 3,283 incidences, up from 712 during the same period a year ago. There were 60 physical assaults among the incidents that the ADL recorded. And just over 500 of these incidents were reported on campuses. It's an ugly situation. Now that's a pretty ugly map showing incidents of anti-Semitism of all types around the US through the middle of December. As one example that hits close to home for me, in mid-December, 10 synagogues in metropolitan Philadelphia got an email bomb threat. One of them was a shul where my daughter is the assistant rabbi. And it is against this backdrop that we see substantial actions by pro-Palestinian young people on various campuses. Now, as I noted, we have seen pro-Palestinian activities at many leading universities, including several Ivy League schools, Stanford University, and major public universities such as UCAL, Berkeley, and Rutgers. These often are in areas with substantial Arab or Palestinian populations, perhaps no surprise there. The question is, why has there been all this pro-Palestinian activity? Part of the answer is simply a matter of very good organization by groups such as Students for Justice in Palestine. That is an outfit that dates back to 2001 at the University of California at Berkeley, really took off in 2011. SJP now has chapters on several campuses across the country. Another part of the answer is the rise over the last few decades of academics, particularly at schools such as Columbia and Rutgers. Those academics and those centers are sympathetic to the Palestinians. As an alum of both Rutgers and Columbia, I confess I have a special interest in them. Such schools have substantial centers for Middle East studies populated by people who sympathize with the Palestinians or who are Palestinians themselves. We've also seen increased enrollments of Arab students, including Palestinians, Palestinian immigrants to the US. And also part of the answer to why there are these demonstrations is the rage and horror at the thousands of deaths in Gaza, even if that reported 25,000 figure is inflated. Now, let me turn to some of the campuses and their particular situations because they're unique in some ways. First, as you all likely know, the short-lived president of the University of Pennsylvania, Elizabeth McGill, found herself in very hot water because she equivocated about whether calls for genocide of the Jews would constitute harassment under university rules. McGill, who had gotten her job just in July of 2022, ran into a buzzsaw last September when there was a furore on the campus over a literary conference of Palestinians that included some notable anti-Semites, particularly Roger Waters, a co-founder of Pink Floyd. Major donors were furious at McGill for permitting this conference to go forward on campus, although properly speaking, it was not a university-sponsored event. It was led by an outside groups, group without, with ties to university groups. Now, the torrent of hostility against McGill grew until she made her verbal misstep under grilling by a congresswoman from New York, Elise Stefanik. When Stefanik asked McGill and leaders of Harvard and MIT whether calling for a genocide against the Jews would amount to harassment, McGill and her colleagues suggested that it would depend on the context. McGill and Claudine Gay of Harvard both later apologized and they clarified their remarks. But the damage to them and to the university's public images had been done. Had they clearly said yes, things might be different. Gay, of course, has resigned under pressure for plagiarism, among other things. So where are we now and what, if anything, should be done? A rather ham-handed part of the solution has been taking place at Rutgers and a few other schools that have suspended or banned Students for Justice in Palestine. SJP has been suspended there and at Brandeis, George Washington University and Columbia University. Columbia also suspended the Jew Jewish anti-Zionist group, Jewish Voice for Peace. And Florida officials are pushing to bar the SJP from all of the state's universities there. Now I say this is ham-handed because disbanding these groups 
won't eliminate the ideas that fuels them. And there's nothing stopping members from organizing themselves independently from the schools, albeit on the campuses. They've, they've created social and political organizations that could easily endure, they'll just change the name. In fact, after George Washington University suspended students for justice for Palestine, and the university president, Ellen Granberg, denounced anti-Semitic messages that were projected onto the library in October, the group formed a new coalition with other groups and marched on her home. And just this past Friday, a coalition of groups staged another demonstration at Columbia. And things are getting very nasty there. Some individuals sprayed a noxious, nauseating substance on the demonstrators. The sprayers have been banned from the campus by Columbia and they are under investigation. The tensions continue. Now, there's also a very real matter of freedom of speech and expression on campuses here. And spraying people with nasty things, of course, is out of bounds. In the academic world, like it or not, people have a, the right to say what they feel. And suppressing speech doesn't do away with the bad ideas. One caveat there, calls for violence or specific targeting of groups for harassment is illegal and, of course, is out of bounds and unacceptable. We are seeing several schools try to halt the pro-Palestinian protests. Penn, Brandeis, the University of Vermont. They're examples of cases where events have been canceled or delayed. Scholarships for some folks have been revoked and some professors are being disciplined. And more than two dozen colleges, including many we've mentioned here, are under investigation by the US Department of Education over complaints of anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. Such schools are required under the Civil Rights Act to take immediate and appropriate action to respond to harassment that creates a hostile environment. As the Chronicle of Higher Education reported, that extends to discrimination against people based on shared ancestry or ethnic characteristics, including Jews, Arabs, Muslims, and Palestinian students. And another example of universities trying to clamp down on some of the intense reactions, a pro-Palestinian student group at Brown University on December 11th staged a sit-in at a university building, and now 41 of the students are facing criminal trespassing charges. But please remember that in some cases, the protests have been blown out of proportion. At the Cooper Union in New York City, for instance, it was widely reported that Jewish students had barricaded themselves in a library as pro-Palestine demonstrators threatened them from the outside. A six-second six video went viral, seemed to support this. Turns out there were no locked doors. And while some of the students said they felt threatened, the threats seemed to have been exaggerated. Now, my answer to all this for what it's worth is we need better educational programs on campuses that explain why slogans such as from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, are in fact calls for the eradication of Israel. As a recent column in the Wall Street Journal noted, many of the young people chanting this nowadays don't even know what river or sea they are, are, being refer they are referring to. The students are simply ignorant. And, and I submit that the best cure for ignorant speech is well-informed speech. Though I do recognize that tempers are pretty short now. It's encouraging that there are campuses on which education about the complex issues of the Middle East is really happening, with the result that there has been less tumult and more honest exchange. My best example is Dartmouth, which has a program that brings together Center for Mideast Studies and a Jewish Studies Center. They've had civil discussions with knowledgeable folks on both sides coming to campus to have open and civil forums, as was the case in this photo. There have been protests at Dartmouth, but not the sort of ugliness that we've seen elsewhere. It's clear from all those surveys, the data that I showed you earlier in polls, that more education is needed, and that's at all levels, starting in K to 12. I found it very troublesome to learn recently about some districts that are teaching really vile things about Israel. In California, a 10th grade history course approved 
by the Santa Ana Unified School District includes readings that call Israel, quote, an extremist illegal Jewish settler, settler population and accuses the country of ethnic cleansing. That's in Santa Ana, California. The Jefferson Union High School District near San Francisco teaches about, quote, Palestinian disposition of lands, identity, and culture through Zionist settler colonialism. Now, these are isolated examples, but troubling ones, and I got those from the Substack, the Free Press. By the way, as I mentioned, there have been few incidences of serious violence, but there have been some. Both Jewish and Arab students at some schools have said they are afraid they could face physical violence or retribution in classes from faculty members sympathetic to one side or another. Do they have a reason for that? In some cases, yes. Three Arab students were shot in Vermont, and one of them, 20-year-old Brown University student Isham Awartani, no longer can use his legs. On campus, Jewish students were assaulted at Tulane and Columbia. At Cornell, the threats of violence against, against Jewish students led to police protection at a Jewish center there. At Rutgers, a freshman went on social media and encouraged people to kill an Israeli student at A.E. Pi, the fraternity. He was identified, promptly charged with bias, intimidation, terroristic threats, and false public alarm. On the other hand, most of the protests, in fact, have been peaceful. And some students haven't been worried about them. A notable commentary on this was published by a senior at Rutgers, a young Jewish woman named Rebecca Rausch. She published this in a blog in the Times of Israel. She wrote about students protesting and wearing kafiyas on campus and said, groups should not be removed from campus for having opposing views and a safe place to express all views is vital. Hearing a different perspective on campus does not constitute a bias incident and does not warrant doxing. I chose to go to a public university because I wanted to be exposed to perspectives different from mine, and this is no different. I am grateful to be a student in a university that protects freedom of speech. That was the young woman at Rutgers. Ms. Rauch attended a Jewish day school as part of a group at Rutgers called Peace is Possible, which allows students of all backgrounds to discuss the relationship in Israel and Palestine. The co-presidents are a Jewish young man and a Palestinian young man. At last word, they say they are continuing to have dialogue, though I got the sense from the school newspaper that things are pretty strained at the moment. At the University of Texas, Austin, Jared Levy, a freshman who had gone to the Abraham Joshua Heschel School in New York and who was the son of two rabbis, had an Israeli flag pinned on his backpack when pro-Palestinian demonstrators marched by one day in November. When he was challenged, he spent an hour and a half talking to students about why he supported Israel. And as reported by the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Mr. Levy talked about the importance of a Jewish homeland, about his conviction that Hamas was a terrorist group and that Israel had made mistakes, but it had a right to defend itself. Some of the students, he said, didn't understand what Hamas was. And they'd just been told by friends on social media that Israel was committing genocide and wasn't an apartheid state. A lot of students have been eager to engage in dialogue. They weren't there just to yell in my face, he said. Still, Anti-Semitism continues to be a challenge at a number of schools. In fact, a major law firm in November partnered with ADL, Hillel, and the Brandeis Center for Human Rights to set up a legal protection hotline for students who have experienced anti-Semitism. More than 500 incidents on some 175 campuses have been reported. And the ADL is now launching a program that will include a report card assessing how campuses are combating anti-Semitism and ranking the schools. At Harvard, a group of Jewish students filed a lawsuit against the university on January 10th, alleging that the school is violating the Civil Rights Act by failing to protect them and that there is rampant anti-Semitism on campus. Similar suits have been brought against the Art Institute of Chicago, NYU, the University of Pennsylvania, the University of California system and its Berkeley campus, and Carnegie Mellon. At Harvard, Rabbi David Wolpe went to the university's divinity school as a visiting scholar last fall. Soon after the October protests, Harvard President Gay called on him to help. He joined an advisory panel to help her respond to anti-Semitism on campus, which is a common approach on many schools. As the Chronicle reported, 
Rabbi Wolpe's inbox has been filled with reports of anti-Semitism at Harvard, and he spent much of his time talking with administrators, donors, and alumni about the problem. Disgusted by President Gay's testimony in Congress and feeling that the panel would not take concrete actions, however, the rabbi quit the group. He said the climate at Harvard was unacceptable. In a tweet, he said, the ideology that grips far too many of Harvard students and faculty, the ideology that works only along axes of oppression and places Jews as oppressors and therefore intrinsically evil is itself evil. He also wrote an op-ed for the Harvard Crimson that said, one can criticize policies without calling for an end to the only homeland Jews have ever known. Known. One can demand a Palestinian state without globalizing the intifada, the term for a protest that previously resulted in over 110 suicide bombings that targeted buses, cafes, and malls. But Rabbi Wolfie has not given up on Harvard. He's still there. He's still trying to help efforts of change. He says such schools must educate students about Judaism and about anti-Semitism. In fact, some schools, including Harvard, are finding a lot of interesting courses about the conflict. Among these are Bard College, the University of Washington, University of Maryland. Harvard's Derek Penslar, a professor of Jewish history, told Inside Higher Ed, the students who walk in my door are not necessarily the same ones as those, as those who are in Harvard Yard screaming. More often, my students are curious, intelligent, and they usually do have a political point of view or another, but they're open-minded or they wouldn't be taking my class. It seems to me that dialogue like that is one of the things that a university education is about. Of course, that's really difficult in the middle of a hot and ugly war. In fact, the student Levi at UT said, folks at Hillel have decided that emotions are too raw for group discussions there. But in time, maybe, such dialogue and educational programs would seem to be the best course. After all, what are schools about if not education? Such programs will not take care of the immediate tensions, but this is a long game. And to win it, academics and we all need to think long term. So that's my presentation. I'd love to hear some questions and some thoughts on it. We had a number of uh, questions that came in in advance of tonight's program, and I'd like to go through a, a number of them uh, for Professor uh, Weber. Uh, are there courses, webinars, speakers, exhibits on the history of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust being publicized and made accessible to greater student bodies? I don't know that they're being publicized, particularly on campuses. There are courses, of course. There are Judaic studies programs at many, many schools. We had one at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. A friend of mine uh, runs that program there. I think those courses are available. What, um, what I would like, like to see happen, frankly, is uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, diversity programs uh, called the DEI programs, in which there's a discussion of the need for tolerance and diversity. I'd love it to make. Uh, I'd love to have anti-Semitism programming be part of those DEI programs, um, so that students unfamiliar with it have mandatory classwork in those things as part of their orientations. Okay. Another question: How can the two million Gaza Palestinians be de-radicalized once Hamas is out of the picture? Uh, this, <laughs> this question was raised by a gentleman who's the author of a book describing Jewish GIs that uh, were re-educated Nazi POWs at the end of World War II. I would have to say that um, that question is well above my pay grade. If I had an answer to that, I think we'd probably have an answer to the, to the, to the tensions in the, in the Middle East. I will say that um, a rabbi that I'm acquainted with um, compared this to Germany after World War II. And his argument was that um, they had the population had to accept that they lost. And um, basically, once they accepted that they lost, they accepted the rebuilding from the West. And, you know, that's got to happen in, in Palestine. I have no idea how that happens. Okay. How are colleges going to recruit administrators 
that are not willing to condemn Hamas and prevent violence on campuses for all students to ensure their safety? I think administrators have been sensitized by the events of the, uh, the last six months, well, since October at any rate. Uh, they've been sensitized to this. So I, I suspect that we're going to see a lot more um, concern about anti-Semitism and uh, openness to educational programming about it. But, but we'll have to see. Okay. There's also obviously, obviously at a number of schools, there have been changes in the top administrators. So sure, sure. we'll see what happens with the new ones. Who's going after the administrators uh, to condemn Hamas, stop the demonization of Israel, and provide the proper nuance about his Palestine with its history, starting with uh, Arafat and President Clinton? Also, prevent violence against Jews and Muslims. Um, again, I think people have been sensitized to these things. They're very, very attentive to them. We've seen a lot of reaction. Um, now, again, I, I think the educational programming has got to continue. It's got to be expanded. Um, and there have to be programs like the one at Dartmouth. You know, I was, uh, I was really encouraged to, to see that. There are centers for Judaic studies and centers for Middle East studies that tend to be Arab oriented on many, many campuses. If they could join forces and team teach and get involved in programming, I think it would be a great thing. There is a very real obstacle that we have to be aware of, though. Many of the faculty members are somewhat radical in these programs, in the Middle Eastern Studies programs. Columbia is a good example. And I think uh, that that's an obstacle. You have to have reasonable people on both sides who are committed to coexistence. And you know those people have to be found. They have to be on those faculties, and they have to teach. Is it true that major corporations are expressing disinterest in future employees who express anti-Semitic ideas in their social social media? Yes. Um, several law firms uh, got headlines in the early going on this because they disinvited um, students who had expressed radical uh, views, radical, radical anti-Israel views. So I suspect that that is a uh, that is going to be an ongoing thing. You know, corporations these days do a lot of social media screening. Um, and they they will check out people. They will see if they have espoused uh, causes that they can't stomach in their companies, and they will not hire them. Okay. Can you talk about the legal aspects of preventing a, a good lecturer to speak uh, in parens by shouting them down at a private or a public <laughs> university? This has been something that I've, I, I think I quoted, I listed my sub stack there at the end in the slides presentation. This is something I've written about a fair bit. Um, it's not legal to shout down a speaker. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's against university rules. Students can be disciplined and are disciplined for that sort of thing. It is, it is not acceptable behavior in a civil forum and, and universities should be civil forums and the students need to be held accountable for that. And that's irrespective of the particular views of the, of the speakers. There has to be toleration. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that universities um, should invite fanatics to speak. I think that that's a dangerous thing and there's often, there's often the possibility of violence. And some schools have kept speakers away because of that possibility of violence. It's a very difficult juggling act, I think, for administrators. In general, I will tell you for what it's worth, <laughs> for my, my humble opinion, I, I tend to believe, I tend to err on the side of free, freedom of expression uh, of, of most points of view, so long as it's not harassment and uh, threatening violence. Um, I think that universities are places where people should talk to one another. And sometimes they do so emotionally. You cross the line if you get into violence or harassment, but you know, exchanging these ideas are what a university is about. Sure. Do you believe that most anti-Semitic protesters on campuses are students or outsiders? And uh, has that had any effect? Well, the truth is I have no idea, um, but my guess would be that they are mostly students. I, you know, I think the students are the ones who care about what's going on on their campuses and they feel comfortable on their campuses protesting. 
There's also, frankly, some faculty members that have been pretty active in a lot of these protests. Again, particularly at Columbia, you can you can find easily you can easily find letters that they've signed that you know have opposed Israel. It's really kind of troubling. Is it true the effects of campus messaging from ADL, JewBelong.org, and Hillel have had an impact on campus rhetoric? I do not, I'm not familiar with those organizations. I'm sorry. I'd have to hear more about them. If they're similar to uh, a Jewish Voice for Peace, for Jewish Voice for Peace, I imagine they have had some impact. Okay, there was a question uh, in the chat. What is Deborah Lipstadt doing about campus issues? Again, I do not know that. Um, I'm familiar with her, broadly speaking, um, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure what she's up to. I do know that the um, uh, US Just Justice Department is investigating over a dozen schools. Um, so I, I think there is clearly some activity by the government. Uh Joe, if I can jump in, because I'm at the State Department, and she's okay. at the State Department, okay? She's mm -hmm. the special envoy for anti-Semitism, so her focus is more international, okay? Uh, gotcha. And working on anti-Semitism, representing us globally on anti-Semitism as opposed to, to in the U.S. domestically. Sorry for jumping Thanks, Bob. That's, that's helpful. Uh, Joe, there was a question uh, in terms of the funding of these outside organizations. Where is that funding, uh, to your knowledge, coming from? No idea. Um, you know, is just SJP funded by sources from the Middle East? I have no clue. It's that hasn't some, hasn't been something that's been reported on. Um, it would be an interesting story, and I'd love to see some journalists dig into that. It would not surprise me if they get funding from outside. Uh, have we seen the uh, extent of uh, what's occurred in the last several months, or do you anticipate that more activity is is brewing out there? Uh, I think I think that you know while a lot of those demonstrations have disappeared from the headlines, they are still taking place. As I mentioned, there was a demonstration at Columbia on Friday. It got into the press because somebody was spraying these pro-Palestinian demonstrators with some pretty noxious stuff. Um, I suspect that so long as the war continues, we are going to see demonstrations. Um, and if it intensifies, we'll see larger ones. We'll, we'll also see other actions off campuses. There, there have been demonstrations in Washington, D.C. in the streets. You're probably familiar with them, Bob. Pretty substantial numbers of people have been marching in the streets there. I don't think so long as the war goes on, there is going to be pressure to stop it. Okay, we have a question in the chat from uh, a good FJMC uh, involved member. Uh, let me look forward here for just a minute. Let's see. Uh, how do we get people to see the double standard being applied that no other war or conflict, no matter how much bloodshed is getting this much attention? You know, uh, Tom Friedman about 30 years ago wrote a book about the extraordinary amount of interest in Israel. Why is it that Israel and the Middle East generate so much attention? There are far bloodier conflicts that have taken place around the world. But for some reason, in the US in particular and in Europe, there's intense interest about the Middle East. I commend that book to you. Um, I, I don't remember the title of it offhand, but it's one of Tom Friedman's first books. And it was, um, it was really interesting. I mean, the, the fact is that mid the Middle East has uh, considerable interest to Christians in the US, of course. Um, it's a consuming part of our Western society or Western history. So people have a lot of interest in it. Um, there are bloodier conflicts. There are uglier conflicts. Um, this one's plenty bloody and plenty ugly, but there have been places where many more people have died. Still, this command, commands a lot of attention. Another question in the chat. You had mentioned about how some protesters did not know uh, what they were protesting or why. Can you compare this obvious ignorance with the, the MAGA movement in this country? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, you're really asking for some problems here. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not sure that I really want to go there in, <laughs> in this chat. I don't want to be attacking attacking Republicans or Democrats or MAGA people. Um, I would simply say that um, my sense of the protesters is that at least the young ones, they simply don't know anything. They, they, they are astonishingly ignorant. There is a video that I, <laughs> it was amazing to me, an actress, Israeli actress named Noah Tishby, I believe is her name, did a TikTok video at the Sundance Film Festival and she interviewed people and she asked them, what river, what sea? They had no clue why they were saying that. One of them said that, oh, Israel is so oppressive of the Palestinians, they don't permit chocolate or wedding dresses in uh, the West Bank. And it was like, okay, what planet do these kids live on? It's a real failure of the education system. What is the argument that DEI programs should be eliminated entirely? For example, noted author Barry Weiss advocates this. Yeah, uh, so again, this is a somewhat controversial program. It's a little off tangent for us, but I'll give you my opinion for what it's worth. I've had good experiences with DEI programs at UNL. Um, DEI programs basically teach people to be sensitive about people of diverse backgrounds and to be inclusive, to understand particularly black right, right relationships in the US. There is a group on the right, including Barry Weiss, who can't abide that. They, for, for whatever reason, they do not want to explore racial history in the US. They'd rather have that sort of thing suppressed and they, and they attack DEI programs as a result of that. Um, now, again, it's a controversial point of view and there may be folks on this call who disagree with me, but um, my experiences with DEI programming at UNL, University of Nebraska-Lincoln were positive ones. I'll give you just one quick example. We had a book club. It was led by a, a black faculty member in the College of Journalism. And we got to read a lot of interesting books and talk about racial relations in a way that never had come up and would not have come up in any other circumstance. It was helpful. In addition, I led a class, co-led a class in which students investigated the racial history in, in journalism coverage in Nebraska. It was eye-opening for everybody involved. The, the opponents of DEI would suppress programs like that. And that's tragic, in my view. Now, having said that, I also yeah. believe that DEI programs need to be broadened. They should include things like anti-Semitism. Can you discuss anti-war protests with those 50 years ago during Vietnam? There were many um, teachings, days of education about it. Is there any way to do this about Israel and Hamas? I'm not sure what the... I'm not sure what the analogy is there. The um, pro-Palestinian folks have had teach-ins. Excuse me, there's a truck going by outside. I hope that doesn't sound too loud. Um, the pro-Palestinian folks have had their own teach-ins, um, and you know, I'm sure that they teach their point of view. Um, I think that there are analogies in the sense that campuses are definitely mobilized um, and, par and, and polarized about this. Um, in Vietnam, as I recall, there, most of the folks, and I, I'm a veteran of some of those protests a long time ago, most of the folks were opposed to the Vietnam War. There weren't a whole lot of people who were speaking out in favor of it. In this case, it is incumbent upon Jewish students and Jewish faculty to get out there and make their voices known and do their own teachings as well, I, su I suggest. Okay, here's an interesting question. As a parent of two children who are at two different universities, both under investigation by the DOE, what can we do to assist and support our students? I have communicated by our concerns by email to the presidents of both universities, including taking the opportunity to speak with one of the presidents during the university's family weekend and stay connected in supporting each of the uh, Hillel organizations. I think that sort of uh, parental pressure and Hillel pressure is extremely helpful. Um, people don't realize this about Claudine Gay at Harvard, but um, she actually sat down with the Hillel students after the October 7th uh, atrocities and, and commiserated with them and, and tried to build bridges to the Hillel. I think that there's, I think there's, administrators are responsive to public 
pressure. Believe me, I have seen that. Uh, they're responsive to politician pressure as well, but they're responsive for, to pressure by parents. I think communicating, you know, making your voice known, doing it in a, in a you know, of course, a civil way is essential. Okay, another question. I just thought about this uh, today that after 9-11, the U.S. attack on Afghanistan was the war on terror, while Israel's defense after October 7th is the Israel-Hamas conflict, or on PBS, the war in the Holy Land. Um, you know, I don't know quite what the description would be that would be appropriate. Um, you know, the one that the one that seems to be most on point to me is that it is Israel-Hamas war. Um, the fact is that they are terrorists. Uh, the Hamas people are terrorists. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I don't find the term uh, to be, I don't find the term to be offensive. That is the term Israel-Hamas war. I don't find that to be offensive, but perhaps some may find that in, to be incomplete. Okay. Uh, Norman, if you're yes. reaching the questions, we had. Do you, do you want to take a couple of questions from the audience? If, yes, yes. I was. If people will was, raise their hand, you can see the little hand. Uh, my my hand thing doesn't work. That's the problem. Oh, okay, because I, I, I have the oh, FJMC. Okay, if you'll take side a and it doesn't from, from Danny. <laughs> Danny, would you like to go ahead? I would love to go ahead. Okay. So. Uh, Professor, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I actually work at Harvard Square, so I <laughs> wit I witness. I'm very I'm very tuned into what's going on at Harvard. Um, um, so, first of all, I can tell you just physically looking at the protesters that a lot of them aren't students. That's not even not even close. I have pictures if you want me to send them to you. I, it's 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 pretty horrible, um, but. Regardless, Harvard is a toxic environment. And I'm so excited when I see people walking around the yarmulkes and I, I applaud them for doing that. Um, and just, just, just leave, you know, and I, I know you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned this uh, new gentleman that was uh, Derek Pensler that was uh, appointed. Uh, if you read the Wall Street Journal today, the editorial, section, I think I, I'm right in line with the Wall Street Journal. I mean, that was not a good move. I mean, but be it as it may. Uh, my, Excuse my, me, Danny, Dan, Danny, I wonder if I might just jump in on that point. I, I'd actually love to hear your thoughts on Pensler. Um, I have gotten in touch with some fellows who I know who are uh, academics in Judaic studies, and they have an enormous amount of respect for him. I'm sure um, he's, he's wonderful, except what's come out of his mouth. Um, you know, he he he's much more. Uh, and I don't want to get political, man. It just. Uh, I'm just curious about it. I, I I don't know him. I don't know much about him other than. Yeah, he he him. he pretty much uh, agrees that uh, Israel is an apartheid state. He said it. Uh, there, so. there's, there's a letter <laughs> that I there's a letter that I commend to you and and to others that he signed that got him in trouble about that. Yeah. Uh, so. That letter was. From so Harvard daughters. just keeps on digging itself. Uh, but my real question okay. is, I, I also will tell you that I grew up in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, which when I grew up there, uh, the high school was 40% Jewish. Um, the high school no longer is 40% Jewish. It's probably 3%, but the town, it's the holy city of Teaneck. You know, it's a, it's the Mecca for, for from Jews. Uh, all the JTS professors live there. It's 50% Jewish. Um, and the school system, the high school system you were describing, that's what happened in Teaneck, New Jersey. That's true. They actually had the Palestinian, the whole thing going on. There were walkouts and protests. I live here in Newton, uh, where there were SWAT stickers in Newton South and horrible things in Newton. So it's everywhere. So my question is, what can we do? Someone kind of asked you that before. Is It's education, I guess, but what can we do what can we do to make a difference? Because because it's it's not really getting better, um, and and right, wrong, and different, and uh, uh, it, it's very, 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 very upsetting, disturbing. I'm a son of a Holocaust survivor too, so to me, you know, a lot of these guys know me. Um, so it's uh, uh -huh. and I see it, I see yeah. it, yeah. 
Dan, Danny, if I may call you Danny. I, I, yes, um, please. <laughs> I, um, I, I wish I had an answer to that. I mean, I can speak about campus educational matters. And I think on campus, we have to have educational programming that starts uh, early in a student's career that sensitizes them to anti-Semitism. And uh, bec because they are surrounded by it in the venues that you're pointing to. Um, and, and that's the only way to deal with it. Um, I, I, think, I think I sort of segment the audience a little bit. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, Palestinian sympathizers, Palestinians, some Arabs, who maybe are unreachable because they're propagandized. On the other hand, you have Jewish students who are not all that knowledgeable and have been becoming some, some sympathetic to the Palestinians. They need education. And then you've got the enormous group in the middle non-Jews, non-Arabs, who they're just ignorant. They're just ignorant. And, and we need to educate them about it. Um, you know, is it going to turn back the tide? I don't know. I mean, you know, all this stuff you could, you could say began or at least got accelerating in Charleston in those, in those awful days. And I, again, I don't want to get into, you know, uh, MAGA politics, but in those uh -huh. awful days when... Um, when the, the, the racists and the anti-Semites had a heyday. And, and it's getting, it is getting worse. I mean, the ADL report on anti-Semitic incidences is really frightening. I don't think we can put our heads in the sand. Um, you mentioned that you applaud uh, people who are wearing kippahs in, in Harvard Square. I mean, that is one way. Be visible, you know, student groups can be visible on campus. They can be out there, you know, they can get the headlines instead of the Palestinian groups. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. It, it's, it's scary. It's a, it's a scary part of American culture right now that, that um, you know, I don't have answers for other than, you know, education. Okay. Uh, Joe, we have another interesting question. You believe in the theory of professional protesters. Um, I'm not sure what that, there he is. I do know that there are some people um, who love to <laughs> protest, and they start out early in their in their years. There was a fascinating story I read recently about a a, a Jewish woman who um, sort of was radicalized by the George Floyd stuff, and then uh, has now become a um, very pro Palestinian activist. I, th I think that I forget which media that was in. It was either the Times or the Journal. Um, it was a very long magazine piece. I think it was maybe the Times. And, you know, I would regard her as a professional protester. Professional professional protester. That was my question about the professional protesters. And I heard that from people, from someone who said that there was a theory going around that the same, that being pro-Palestinian seems to be the cause celebrity right now. And it kind of started with the George Floyd and Black Lives Black Lives Matter. And it goes to the, the comment that someone made that if you look at some of these protesters, they're not college students. They are a group of people who kind of just go around and pick up some cause, whatever it might be, and go and incite these protests. And it was Black Lives Matter. And now it's that Israel is an oppressive state. And um, that's the professional um, the professional, uh, what was I going to say, protest thing. And then the other comment that I want to know if you could address is that we sit here and we talk about how we need to educate like non-Jewish people. Well, how can we expect people who are not Jewish to understand what's going on when there are young Jewish people who are out there protesting against Israel? That's where I find, that's what I find the worst is when you have young Jewish people sitting there cause, causing for a ceasefire and going out there and saying that Israel was wrong. Um, I don't disagree with you at all. I think young Jewish people need to be educated. I think the surveys that I shared earlier are proof that there's a lot of ignorance among, among young Jewish people as well. And, um, you know, there, there, there tends to be a sympathy for the underdog and they tend to view uh, the Palestinians as underdogs. Again, there is this 
you know, black white situation, there's an ignorance of nuance. Um, it's a real challenge. Okay, before we wrap things up, Joe, there is another question. Uh, to build dialogue, shouldn't we be encouraging programs like Palestine uh, rights at Penn instead of knee jerk opposing them? Don't we need to invest in these relationships in order to improve them? Um, I'm not sure that um, groups like the, like the Palestine rights um, organization are the best forum uh, for these things, so long as they are inviting um, notorious anti-Semites uh, like Roger Waters, and there were others there, uh, to be part of that discussion. I think that um, it would be useful to be able to have a voice at such organization in such meetings and so on. I'm not sure how that can be done. There have to be people in that organization that are willing um, to welcome Jews and to willing to welcome a different point of view. And that's a challenge. Okay, it thank would be, you. It would, be, it would be great to, to engage them. Sure. Um, great to be party to those discussions. I think it's pretty tough to do. But there are places where faculty members of very different points of view have come together and at least had civil discussions. It is possible. Whether it's possible in the Palestine rights organization, that's a little tougher. There seems to be a lot of stuff in the chat. I, I haven't actually looked at that, but have you seen those questions? Yes. Yeah, I, guess. Yes. Uh, I think we've covered a good number of them. Let's see here. Uh, one here. It seems as if the Palestinians are the new cause celebrate. Yeah, yeah, we, we did. Yeah. yeah, I think that I, I think that, that uh, the, the speaker who said that uh, is on to something. I don't know about the professional protesters, but it is definitely a uh, a cause celeb. And um, it's tough for Jews to counter that, Jewish students to counter that. Um, there have been pro-Israel demonstrations at some schools, and maybe we need more of those. Here's uh, Jeremy Zweig has a fascinating one, uh, Norwin. Yes. Says, I'm a pan Penn alum, and I know that our students are very capable to ingest and evaluate complex points of view. Roger Waters aside, it was discouraging for me to see the effort to completely cancel the Palestine rights program last year. When you say that it's the kind of programming that would help people of differing backgrounds to better understand each other, isn't there a middle ground? And we're not doing a great job of exploring. Yet, yeah, I'm sure there is a middle ground. Um, and we should explore that. Um, and it would be nice <laughs> if the Palestine rights program would embrace a broader point of view, um, kind of hard to, kind of hard to deal with that. On behalf of Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, uh, I know we owe you a debt of gratitude for all the uh, insight, knowledge, and information you've provided this evening. And I'm sure we'll have you back at some point in the future. For those that uh, want to continue to read about what Professor uh, Weber has written about. Uh, we can provide that information uh, as a follow-up to the uh, webinar this evening. And uh, we will also make uh, you aware that uh, the uh, original promotion on this uh, program this evening uh, provided more detailed article that you can access online. So I think with that, Joe, uh, Professor Weber, we would like to thank you for your time and efforts uh, this evening. I know uh, you've uh, certainly given us a, a lot to think about, and uh, we appreciate everyone who's stayed on the call uh, over multiple time zones here this evening. Thanks again, Norman. Thank you.